Patricia Neal in HUD for her portrayal of the slovenly, affectionate housekeeper. Now, another movie, of course, that made you very famous was HUD. You received the Academy Award for that. And you have a little miniature uh, statue on your chain, and that's the small Academy, that's the small <laughs> Oscar. Yes. Um, HUD. I forget who gave me this. Oh, it's Somebody just, it's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and what was it like to receive an Academy Award? A lot of actors and actresses, including Henry Fonda, for example, have never received one. Uh, and you got one, you know, early in your career. Well, unfortunately, I was pregnant at that time. <laughs> again. <laughs> so, uh, pregnant again, uh -huh. like always. And uh, I could not collect it because I had my baby in about two weeks' time. <laughs> and dear Annabella, who is the French actress, married to Jerome Power once, she's a great friend of ours, and she was in Hollywood, so she collected it for me. Hollywood rediscovers Patricia Neal. This is how many reviewers back in 1963 and 64 saw Patricia Neal's performance in HUT and her subsequent win for Best Actress. As with many other comebacks, this did not mean that she had abandoned acting completely, but rather it was seen as a return to the A-list of Hollywood, a project finally worthy of all her talents. And it was seen as a comeback of Patricia Neal as a person, a woman who had shown overwhelming strength again and again and never surrendered to the personal tragedies of her life. Tragedies that so far inspired two movies based on her experiences. And this is my wife, Patricia Neal, star of stage and screen. Patricia Neal was a fighter and a survivor, and a natural and gifted actress who always gave 100% to every project she was involved in. Interest in acting took hold of Patricia Neal at a young age, when she first appeared in school productions. At the age of 10, she put a card in her stocking at Christmas that said, Dear Santa, what I want for Christmas is to study dramatics. I was a church, a Methodist church, and I'd gone there after, you know, one evening, and I had seen a lovely woman giving monologues. Ah, oh, what agony, Read, I've never seen anything so beautiful in my life, and I wanted lessons to give monologues. That was my idea, <laughs> to entertain people giving monologues all my life. So I, I started these beautiful lessons with my, um, uh, my father's boss's daughter, really. And then, then I saw a play, decided to join the group. Uh, and that's when I knew I very much wanted to be an actress. Everyone who experienced Patricia's work sensed right away that she had a natural talent for the stage. In 1945, Patricia would then set out to conquer Broadway, attending acting classes and going to as many auditions as possible. When the day would break, I would be on the streets, going office after office after office, agents, people casting, everything. I never, ever, ever took it easy and said, oh, I'm, you know, I really worked for it. And happily, I got employed very quickly. I think it was there about three months when I was employed. And everything would fall into place for her very quickly when her name was recommended to playwright Lillian Hellman for her new production, Another Part of the Forest, a prequel to her previous success, The Little Foxes. Even 20 years later, Hellman still remembered Patricia Neal's audition. I let her read for about three minutes and then I stopped her. I knew she was right. Another part of the forest opened in New York in November 1946, starring Patricia Neal as Regina, a role that had been made famous by Tallulah Bankhead on the stage and Betty Davis on the screen. Why did you marry me? Because I was lonely when I was young. Yes, lonely. Not in the way people usually mean. I was lonely for all the things I wasn't going to get. For Patricia Neal, it was everything she had ever wished for. Opening night was both the most frightening and most wonderful night of my life. I knew for certain that the reason I wanted to be an actress was for that moment. While reviews for the play itself were mixed, Patricia Neal received glowing notices, was called extraordinarily vital and memorable. Giants like Eugene O'Neill and Catherine Connell would compliment her work and even Tallulah Bankhead praised her like only Tallulah Bankhead could. You are as good as I am. and. Darling, if I only called you half as good as I am, it would be a hell of a compliment. 
then it was very good for me. It wasn't, wasn't the big hit that The Little Foxes was. We thought it would be, but it uh, didn't turn out to be that big. But it ran, it ran for about six months and it was good. Overnight, Patricia Neal was, as she called it, the toast of the town. And she would receive the very first Tony Award for Best Featured Actress. During this time, she also became one of the first members of the actor's studio with the likes of Maureen Stapleton, Eli Wallach and Marlon Brando. Of course, Patricia Neal's success on the Broadway stage did not go unnoticed in Hollywood. She remembered, producers like George Stevens, Samuel Goldwyn and David Selznick invited me to supper to discuss my future career plans. Selznick apparently even promised Patricia Neal an Academy Award if she would sign with him, but the young actress was disgusted by the producer. He got very drunk, told me how much he loved Jennifer Jones and then tried to get me into bed. I nearly pushed him down the stairs. Patricia instead signed with Warner Brothers, which offered her the most generous deal, including the leading role in the upcoming movie version of the Broadway hit John Loves Mary. Signing with Warners most likely also prevented her from recreating a stage role as Regina in the movie version of Another Part of the Forest, which was produced by Universal with Anne Blyce as Regina. Like Neil, Anne Blyce had also made her Broadway debut in a play by Lillian Hellman, Watch on the Rhine. $5,000. You better go in now. Later, Patricia Neal would say, I went to Hollywood much too early in my career. I should have had the sense to stay a few more years on Broadway, but for now her goal was clear. I wanted to be the greatest actress to ever appear on the screen. The Germans are back to their wives and sweethearts. The Italians are back. The Japanese are back. The only woman in the whole world who's being kept apart from the man she loves is, is me. Oh, who won the Dawn War anyhow? When she arrived in Hollywood, Patricia Neal became part of the expected publicity machine as Warner Brothers introduced her as their new major star from the Broadway stage and as the, what else, next greater Garbo. And I was met by an agent and he took me to the Bel Air Hotel, which was where I lived to begin with. Wow, it was so fabulous to go at this great hotel and and past the water and everything and great peace. It was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And I thought, ah, that I was in heaven. After Patricia completed her movie debut, John Loves Mary, the studio immediately looked for her next project. And it was one of the most sought after female roles in Hollywood that would change her life forever. Basically, every actress from Jennifer Jones, Jean Tierney and Lauren Bacall to Betty Davis and John Crawford was interested in the female lead of Warner Brothers' prestige project The Fountainhead. Apparently even Greta Garbo was sent a copy of the script. The most likely casting choice, however, was Barbara Stanwyck, who also claimed that she had brought the material to the attention of Warner Brothers in the first place. But things would turn out differently. All of a sudden this man, riding a bicycle. He stopped. His name was King Vitor. And we began to talk. And I had no idea who he was, but I'm a friendly woman. And um, I don't know, we talked for about 15 minutes or 20 minutes, and he said to me, I'd like you to test for the Fountainhead. Ah, I was so thrilled. For the rest of her life, Patricia Neal would remember the moment she met her new co-star, Gary Cooper, for the first time. I looked up into the ravishingly handsome face. For me, there was no one else in that room. Gary Cooper was obviously one of Hollywood's biggest male stars of the time. He was an Oscar winner, a box office hit, beloved by critics, columnists and audiences. And he had been married to former actress Veronica Belf, often called Rocky, since 1933. The couple also had a daughter by the name of Mariah, who was born in 1937. But while shooting The Fountainhead, Gary and Patricia immediately sensed the attraction between them. And when the movie was finished, Patricia Neal remembered, the moment had come. I knew it and so did he. He asked, may I drive you home? The answer was, no, I have my own car, but you can follow me. Gary Cooper was, I mean, I happened to adore him. I adored his looks, I adored his 
I mean, he to me was a fabulous man. So. But he was married. Did, did oh, that yes. bother you? Well, of course it did, but I was so stupid at that in those days of my life. I didn't know that I should, that I should have had respect for marriage and left him alone, you know. When one's young, one, you want what you want when you want it, and you can get into bad trouble that way. Gary Cooper had had affairs with co-stars before, and Patricia Neal herself also had affairs with married men while working in New York, but for both of them, this was different. Though 25 years apart, both shared a sense of humor and look on life, and their casual affair would soon turn into a serious relationship. Both of them had found the love of their lives. Oh well, I mean, he was so beautiful. I loved his looks, I mean, I loved his eyes. Where they were beautiful. And he was witty. He really was. He was great fun. Even though Patricia Neal knew that she was the other woman, it was one of the happiest times she had ever experienced. However, the illusion soon began to crumble. First of all, her career did not go the way either she or Warner Brothers had expected. For Patricia Neal, acting in front of the camera was completely different to stage acting, and she lacked experience and training. Unsurprisingly, her reviews for John Loves Mary were mixed. Critics praised her voice and line deliveries, but according to them, her facial expressions left much to be desired, and Bosley Crowther wrote in the New York Times that this brand new Warner girl had a lot to learn. But even worse, The Fountainhead, Warner's big prestige production, was completely destroyed by the critics, who called it cold and unemotional, and Patricia Neal was described as a moody heroine without any honest feelings and entirely affected. After the premiere of the movie, actress Virginia Mayo went to Patricia Neal and said, my, weren't you bad? And Warner Brothers began to wonder if their hopes in this young actress had been exaggerated. You won't break me. I know how to fight it. I'm not afraid of them any longer. But most of all, it was the affair with Gary Cooper that took a toll on Patricia Neal. On the one hand, her love for him was unconditional. As she said, I wanted to be with Gary always, never parted, not even briefly. But on the other hand, she began to realize that I had no rights with him. We were not building a future together. He came into my life as he wanted. She also sensed that Gary was unlikely to ever leave his family for her. Patricia realized that he simply did not want to get involved in any conflict. Conflict was something Gary was a master at avoiding. He wanted the best of two worlds. If all I wanted was to pass that time away, I wouldn't have to come this far from town. Why did you come so far then? I thought you knew. Still, Gary would eventually confess his feelings for Patricia Neal to his wife Rocky. However, a divorce was out of the question as Rocky refused and Gary himself would also not push for it as he did not want to cause any situation that might harm his daughter. Patricia Neal would always remember meeting the young girl after she learned of the affair. The child looked at me and spat on the ground. It was a memory that would haunt her forever. If I lose you, I'll roam around like a homeless alley cat with no place to come back to. During this time, Patricia continued to appear in mostly neglectable movies. She, however, had by now, also due to further acting lessons, mastered the art of movie acting and many critics reacted positively to her performances, often calling her brilliant and unforgettable, and especially Luella Parsons became a big supporter of her work. Still, after her role in Operation Pacific, Warner Brothers did not renew her contract. As she put it, I certainly had not become the new Garbo. I guess the quicker the goodbyes, the less embarrassment, so, so if you don't mind, good day. It's nice knowing you, I think. During this time of professional crisis, Patricia Neal also became pregnant. Sensing that a child with a married man would destroy the rest of her career and basically her entire life, and also realizing that Gary Cooper would not stand by her if she had a child, she agreed to an abortion. Later she would say, for years and years I cried over that baby. It was horrifying, you, you know, it really was, but you know, you didn't mention it to a soul and you had to do this horrendous thing and so what happened during that time i mean was he with you was gary cooper with you i mean was it i mean that that must have been oh, yes. terrible oh yes oh yes he he um he we went through it together you know and and 
And it was uh, very sad, but uh, we had to. Ingrid Bergman. That's right. She was the first one to let it be known. And people, oh, they hated her, you know. I could not have done that at my age. I could not have endured what she had to endure. She was a fabulous, brave, brave woman, and I would like to applaud her now. After Patricia Neal left Warner Brothers, she signed a three-picture deal with 20th Century Fox, where she would make one of the most famous movies of her career, The Day the Earth Stood Still. But focusing on her work became basically impossible for her, because in 1951, Gary Cooper officially left his wife. By this point, the affair between him and Patricia Neal was an open secret in Hollywood. However, only one person took the blame. Gossip about Gary and me was being whispered all over town. No one wanted to be on the wrong side when the lines were finally drawn. I was the unsympathetic side of a triangle. The press was relentless now. They followed me everywhere. I'm just asking you not to print it. Columnists portrayed Patricia Neal as a cold, heartless homewrecker and many members within the Hollywood circles began to avoid or openly reject her. No one ever came out and criticized me to my face, but it was more than low-key snubs at parties now. People I thought were my friends were cutting me dead. Gary Cooper, as usual, wanted to avoid any conflict and continued to keep quiet about the whole situation, never discussing his affair until the day he died. Patricia Neal was pretty much left on her own. That's one humiliation I won't stand for. You're not going to drag me through a divorce court. Obviously, the situation physically and mentally almost destroyed her. Torn between her ongoing love for Gary Cooper, but also feeling the shame for her affair and suffering from the public condemnation. It's unclear if she would have been willing to go on like this, but when Gary Cooper's mother confronted her with the words, Do you know what you are? She realized that she could not go on like this and ended the relationship. What was it in your spirit that said, fight, keep working, get back to it? I don't know, darling. I just made the way I made. And it's a stubborn woman. <laughs> I am. I mean, I just don't want to lose. Yeah. I really mean, yeah, I've lost a lot, but I, I don't want to lose. I mean, I hate to be defeated, but you know, it's a, so I'll fight all the way. Patricia Neal suffered long and hard from the breakup and needed professional help to mentally and physically heal. I felt as if my life had burst apart from the inside. Everything that had given life any meaning for me was torn into shreds. Friends of Gary Cooper also said that he never got over losing Patricia Neal, but desperate to hold on to a normal life, he would eventually return to his wife. Patricia Neal returned to New York. The hostile environment of Hollywood was no option for her anymore. And again, it was Lillian Hellman who gave her another important break. The children's hour. It was... I, I had, uh, you know, the idea of being in it was so good to me. And uh, as I said, Kermit said, yeah, you can come and read if you want to. So I read it and I read so magnificently they let me choose uh, which part I played. And I chose to play Martha. And that is, uh, let's see, uh, one that's accused of being a lesbian, and I kill myself in the end, which I like doing. <laughs> I think that's what I wanted, someplace to kill myself at that point in my life. Playing the role of Martha opposite Kim Hunter, Patricia could show that she had lost none of her talents, and critics praised her return to the Broadway stage. She also rejoined the actor studio, focusing all her energy on rebuilding her stage career and her reputation as an actress. And also her private life would fall into place again when she met English author Roald Dahl, known today for writing classics such as James and the Giant Peach or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. What was he like? Oh, when I first looked at him, I thought, oh, very handsome. And I would... Uh, I would like to meet him. And well, we sat beside each other at the supper table. He didn't talk to me one minute. <laughs> he talked to Leonard Bernstein, who was sitting across the table from him. And at the end of the supper, I said, 
I don't ever want to see him again. And uh, then I guess he called me about two days later and asked me out. And I said, oh, so sorry. Can't go. Thank you for calling. I made the mistake of saying. And then he called me again a couple of days later. Well, I couldn't think of an excuse, so I went and here we are. Their casual encounter soon turned into a serious relationship. A relationship completely different from her affair with Gary Cooper. She described Dahl as consistent but dispassionate. He knew exactly what he wanted and he quietly went about getting it. He took possession of me and I let it happen. Patricia Neal was honest to herself that she did not love Dahl, but still felt that he would give her what she was longing for. Stability and a family. What was I holding out for? A great love? That would never come again. Also, I did not love him, I admired him deeply. And at that time in my life, admiration was more important than love. The marriage would not have the easy and relaxed quality she had experienced with Gary Cooper. Instead, it was hard work, but for her, it was real and it was hers. Welcome home, Mrs. Dove. What's the matter? Only got one shoe on. Let's do something about that, shall we? In 1955, Patricia Neal gave birth to her first child, Olivia, and by 1961, two more children would follow. Acting-wise, she did not work in any grand Broadway plays or movies, but she continued to appear on the stage around the country or in television productions, almost always to glowing reviews. Hollywood by now seemed decades away. I have given up all ideas of being a movie star. I found out how useless the whole thing is. I always feel guilty when I'm having a good time. <laughs> I always feel guilty when I'm not. Oh. How do you feel now? Oh, very guilty. In 1957, she received a lot of praise for her return to the big screen in Ilya Kazan's A Face in the Crowd, being called excellent, the best she had ever been, and predictions for an Oscar nomination began right away. But the movie was overall a critical failure and box office disappointment, and Warner Brothers did not promote it for awards consideration. Patricia Neal summed it up as, A Face in the Crowd had not established me as a sought-after movie actress. Mostly, she now focused on her private life, taking care of her children as well as her home. Acting for her had mainly practical reasons. Dahl was not writing as fast as was expected by his publishers and Patricia Neal had to keep working to also support the family financially. In 1958, she made her stage debut in London in the role of Catherine in Suddenly Last Summer and received probably the greatest reviews of her career so far. Patricia Neal remembered that producer Sam Spiegel came to see the play and was so impressed that he immediately acquired the movie rights. She was very certain that the role in the movie version would be hers. But the part ultimately went to a much bigger star who had just done a Tennessee Williams movie the year before. Patricia would later say, losing that film was the hardest professional blow of my life. But to be fair, it probably made sense in the end. Don't get me wrong, I can easily imagine Patricia Neal in a suddenly last summer like this. Nobody, nobody on earth could possibly believe it. And I don't blame them. They had devoured parts of him. But not so much in a suddenly last summer like this. It looked as if... As if they had devoured him! Another great chance came for Patricia in 1959, when she was offered the role of Helen Keller's mother in Arthur Penn's Broadway play The Miracle Worker. Patricia Neal was slightly offended at first that she was not offered the central role of Annie Sullivan, but I was not in a position to demand a star spot. If I was to keep working, I would have to go with what I was offered. Still, she remembered her time with The Miracle Worker very fondly and she formed a close bond with director Arthur Penn and co-star Anne Bancroft. And critics would happily praise her authority in the role, calling her yearning yet realistic and simply excellent. After that, Patricia Neal received an unexpected offer from Hollywood for a supporting role in the Audrey Hepburn classic Breakfast at Tiffany's. Reviewers applauded her comeback to the big screen, but the part did overall not make a very big impression. Let me look at you. 
Uh, are you through? Was the flight? I, I, I'm in a terrible gushly. rush. Still, Patricia Neal was more than content with her life at this moment, as she enjoyed her time with her family and could quietly continue her acting career, which allowed her to play different parts and provided her with a steady source of income. But tragedy would strike her life when on December 5th, 1960, a cab hit the baby carriage of her one-year-old son, Theo, in the streets of New York. Theo suffered from severe damages to his head and Patricia Neal remembered my precious doll was shattered. He was, uh, I know, I'd, I was shopping then at the A&P and, uh, and I, I saw my daily woman looking for me and she said, uh, I'm sorry to tell you but your son was hit by a taxi. Well, I dropped everything mm -hmm. on the ground and, and I ran up and I told her all about it and he, he was at uh, somebody else's apartment, you know, somebody in the... He worked in somebody else's apartment, and uh, he just put his pencil down, and and we went downstairs, and we went. Then we went to the hospital, and the doctor said he will die. But against all odds, Theo would survive. The little boy had eight operations on his head in 30 months, was temporarily blind, and would continue to have health problems for many years. But he was able to recover over time. Patricia Neal often said that taking care of Theo brought her family closer together than ever before. My love for my husband grew as I observed his love for our son. We were growing closer. It was a matter of knowing we could count on each other. Because your son had, had this terrible trauma to his yes. brain, he had to have a tube that had yes. to be drained. And that this, it kept on getting clogged and your yeah. husband said, hey, there's got to be a better way. Yes. And this is the tube you're talking about. He found a better way. That he, other... he and two other people, well, one other man worked on it. And they, uh, they do have it and it's very good. Around the same time, Patricia Neal also learned that Gary Cooper had died from cancer. Despite all the sorrow of their time together, she kept the memory of their love for the rest of her life. To this day, whenever I see Gary on the screen, I fall in love with him all over again. In later years, you met Gary Cooper's daughter, who at mm -hmm. the time hated you, and Gary Cooper's wife. I understand that that uh, that you eventually made peace yes. with both of them. Oh yes, and I like them both very much now. They are, you know, it's, it's odd how things come to as they should come occasionally. Due to the high medical costs in America, Dahl and Patricia Neal then decided to move to England for good. This move and taking care of her son prevented Patricia Neal from reprising her part as Helen Keller's mother in the movie version of The Miracle Worker. As she described it, I seemed to be in early retirement. After Theo had become well again and the family had settled into their permanent life in England, tragedy would strike again when their oldest daughter Olivia, now seven years old, came home from school and informed her mother that there was an outbreak of measles. Patricia Neal remembered, a strange feeling crept over me. Three days later, Olivia would get sick herself and die a short time later. It was again a time of overwhelming grief for Patricia Neal who, in her own words, kept going on like a madwoman to overcome her pain. To get on with her life, but also due to the high cost of Theo's medical care, Patricia Neal continued acting, mostly on TV. One of her performances was caught by director Martin Ritt, who also knew Patricia Neal from her time at the actor's studio. He sensed that her natural sincerity and simplicity on the screen would be perfect for the main female part in his next project called Hot Bannon, a movie based on a novel Horsemen Pass By by Larry McMurtry. Hut, as the movie would ultimately be called, was one of the earliest examples of the demythologizing of the American Western that took place in the 60s and 70s, followed later by movies such as McCabe and Mrs. Miller or Little Big Man. Director Martin Ritt found the only relevant female part of the movie, the housekeeper Elmer, difficult to cast and was at first hesitant to offer it to Patricia Neal. 
It was maybe the only relevant female part, but it was still very small and therefore possibly uninteresting for many actresses. But both Patricia Neal and her husband like the script as well as the character of Alma and, after all, a job means money and a job in movies means more money than on the stage. Now they give free two-week trips to Europe, but I end up with the fountain pens and the Japanese binoculars. In the original novel Horsemen Pass By, the character of Alma Brown is called Helmea, and she is a woman of color. Director Ritt felt that audiences were not ready yet to see a relationship between Paul Newman and a colored actress and rewrote the part, which unsurprisingly did not cause any controversy at the time. Besides the color of her skin, the sexuality of Helmea was also much more subliminal in the movie and while the white Alma is a never-ending symbol of efficiency, Halmea in the book is described as reading true romances and sitting on her butt nine-tenths of the time. About the movie version of Alma, Patricia Neal said, Alma had no real heights, no dramatic monologues, and she played mostly in the background to the other characters. But I knew her in my bones. Also, Alma was a brief role, it was strong. I had thought my days when I would be offered a part like Alma were over. I've been all over this cow country. I'm the exact right place and exact right people. So once it got stopped, I wouldn't have to be moving again. Shooting of Hot was, in general, a very warm experience, with all parties showing enormous respect towards each other. Martin Ritt appreciated Patricia Neal for being willing to try anything to get a good performance, and Paul Newman described her as truly gifted, with a patient quietness, only concerned about the faithfulness of the script. And do you remember how you described Alma? Oh, go on. I don't know how to, how to describe her. She's a, uh, she's just a good woman. She's a good, good woman, and she, she knows the bad one when she sees one. Even though she's a little attracted to him, but it, I don't give in to that, and that's very good. And um, no, but it's a, it's a loving part. I, I like it. After its release, Hutt won a lot of acclaim at the Venice Film Festival, but did not receive any awards to the dismay of many American, but also Italian news outlets, who felt that the movie had been unjustly ignored, stating, Rarely has a festival finished so badly, with verdict so unjust and mistaken. Especially complaining that both Paul Newman and Patricia Neal had been overlooked. Oh, you got all that charm going for you, and it makes the youngsters want to be like you. That's the shame of it, cause you don't value nothing. On its US release, Hutt also earned a lot of praise. Reviews were very positive and it was called an entertaining, truthful and modern western, carried by a splendid ensemble, even if most reviewers naturally focused their attention on the central work by Paul Newman, stating that it's impossible not to be attracted to his bad guy, which gave the movie most of its complexity. Paul, oh, get your butt out of here, I can't think with you standing around. Knock some people on their tails around here, you just might be one of them. Come on, get out of here! But reviewers did not overlook Patricia Neal and cherished the fact that Hutt finally gave her the comeback role that everyone had been waiting for, that she gave quite simply the best performance of her career and she was called one of America's most undervalued actresses. She was applauded for the effect of her dark voice and a brilliant performance of wit, womanliness and dignity that made dishwashing and kitchen chores appealing. However, some reviewers noted that, due to her short screen time, the character was little more than sentimental irrelevancy. I'll remember you, honey. You're the one that got away. The great reviews for Patricia Neal made her for many an immediate Oscar contender, but for Best Supporting Actress. So what happened that made Patricia Neal ultimately the frontrunner in the leading category? The decisive factor in the race appears to be the New York Film Critics. The organization did not establish awards for supporting players until the 1969 season. However, if a supporting part gained enough passion among its members, it could play a role in their voting. For example, in 1943, Ida Lupino won Best Actress for The Hard Way, but the runner-up was Katina Paxenu for For Whom the Bell Tolls, a role that won her the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. And in 1947, the runner-up to Deborah Carr in the Best Actress race was Celeste Holm for a 15-minute work in Gentleman's Agreement, which also won her an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. 
and then there was Agnes Moorhead, nominated at the Oscars in Supporting, who actually won the Best Actress Award in New York for The Magnificent Ambersons. With the win for Patricia Neal, the New York critics sent two signals. One, they made it clear, in what many at the time saw as a lackluster year for actresses, her performance is the clear go-to choice. The New York critics held such affection for her work in HUD that she won the Best Actress Award on the first round of voting, and only one other actress received any votes besides Patricia Neal. And second, the New York critics established Patricia Neal as a leading actress moving forward. Sensing a chance to benefit from the general lack of enthusiasm for this year's leading actresses, Paramount decided to take a chance and changed her Oscar campaign from supporting to leading and other award bodies agreed as Patricia Neal won further Best Actress distinctions from the National Board of Review and the BAFTAs. In fact, the only irrelevant award Patricia Neal lost during the award season was for Best Supporting Actress, at the Golden Globes where the winner was Margaret Rutherford for the VIPs. Even though her performance is not too well remembered today, Margaret Rutherford was a very popular Oscar winner in 1963, constantly singled out in reviews for the VIPs, and it seems possible that, had Patricia Neal been campaigned in supporting, she might have lost the Oscar. After a win, she sent a telegram to Marty Ritt that simply stated, it was not too small. You're one of the best people there ever was. In fact, you're good, period. Apart from her strong reviews, Patricia Neal also benefited from the fact that in a race so shaped by unwed mothers or prostitutes, as this article so charmingly describes, her performance as the woman who rejects the man was seen as the safest choice. And so by Oscar night, Patricia Neal's momentum as well as the sympathy on her side had made her win pretty much a foregone conclusion. I know, sympathy is often used to describe wins that might not have won based on merits alone, and Patricia Neal did have undeniable critical acclaim. But it seems pointless to not emphasize that the personal tragedies of her life did influence the attitude of Oscar voters who would otherwise maybe not vote for such a small and restrained performance, no matter how critically acclaimed it may be. Even co-nominee Leslie Caron commented on the race, sometimes sentiment influences the judging, but that's the way it should be. John Fontaine gets it too. Part of the reason we do vote for the Academy, yes. people ha have ulterior reasons. If, as many an actor said, we all were in the same role, then we could find out the best actors but, or actor. There's still other reasons that you give uh, the a vote to somebody. Could be sometimes for losing out the year before they give somebody the Yes, year. and I think that uh, uh, if somebody's had a great tragedy. Patricia Neal herself said of the whole awards race, I was genuinely surprised by the attention I received. I knew that I had turned in a good performance and secretly hoped that Alma would get me more work, but I was unprepared for accolades. Not that I thought that they were wrong. Well, you just try to do a good job. You get a role and you try to think out what it's about. And you go to work, that's all. Uh, but it, I think I did a, fair job in that film, and uh, I like doing it very much. And indeed, besides the awards, there were also many acting offers coming Patricia Neal's way. Hutt had finally put her back on the map. However, she had to decline various offers, such as the lead in The Pumpkin Eater, as she was expecting her fourth child. Still, she had triumphantly returned and said, just coming out on top for a change felt damn good. Knowing better than to push her luck, Patricia Neal stayed in England and did not attend the Oscar ceremony and gave birth shortly after her win. When one of her children asked her what an Oscar was, she answered, it's a great golden boy who whispers in your ear what you have known all your life. <laughs> what a good thing for me to say. It's a great golden boy, is that right? Um, but um, no, I was very happy to win that. That was delicious, you know. So let's look at the performance that won Patricia Neal the Oscar and overdue acclaim. First, let's deal with the most concerning question. Yes, judged purely on its own, this is most likely a supporting performance. Not since Louise Reiner in The Great Siegfeld did a role with such a small amount of screen time win the Best Actress Award. Hutt focuses on a conflict between three generations of men, played by Melvin Douglas, Paul Newman and Brandon DeWilder. And Alma does not touch their conflict. 
the truth is that her entire storyline could have been cut without affecting the overall plot. And in fact, Patricia Neal's favorite scene actually did end up on the cutting room floor. You said in your book they cut this out, what is life all about? Brandon DeWilda asked you, what's life all about, Alma? And you said, honey, you'll just have to ask somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry that scene was cut, but um, they thought it was too much or they didn't think it was necessary. However, the wonderful thing about Patricia Neal's work is that, despite all this, she doesn't appear to be supporting anyone in HUD. She is completely her own person and keeps her distance just as much by choice as by the guidance of the script. Yes, Alma might not be a part of HUD's overall world, but instead, Patricia Neal created Alma's own world right next to it. She is one of the few characters in the history of this category who doesn't seem to exist within the movie, but who had already experienced a great deal before we even see her and who will continue to go her own way long after the movie has ended. The script might only see her as an object of affection for Hutt, but Patricia Neal's performance is a stunning example of an actress taking underdeveloped material and injecting wisdom, life, intelligence, passion, years of experience and reality into her character. Emma Brown was not destined to become a center of attention in Hutt, but due to Patricia Neal's work, you cannot imagine it any other way. How come you're always running your car over my zinnias? I've been trying to get those things come up for two weeks. Don't plan them where I park. You're cheerful this morning. Missy, your job is to keep house, not worry about my disposition. Frying pan still on, want a couple of eggs? Or did you have breakfast in bed? Nope. We haven't quite gotten around to breakfast. I mean, to be fair, yes, Patricia Neal can go only so far in heart. In her 20 minutes of screen time, she mainly exists to reject Hutt's advances. Compare this to, for example, Vivian Lee, who has three hours to present Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind and leads her through various important changes in her life. But it's also impossible to deny that Patricia Neal fully realized the potential of Alma and that she makes you truly forget about her screen time or her lack of influence on the overall storyline. And she never seems to exist from somebody else's point of view but only as her own person. Alma, you want to blow some foam off of some beer? No, thanks. I'm gonna get up out of this swing, set some biscuits, go to bed. I'll settle for half that action. <sighs> and Patricia Neal achieves this undeniable presence by a completely unexpected approach. Her performance is one of the most straightforward, subtle and low-key pieces of work this category has ever seen. There are no big breakdowns, no big scenes, no big emotions, no attempts to make a big impression in a small part. Elma Brown is a completely calm, relaxed, wise and unflashy creation. Take her introduction for example. How many actresses would have used this one line to hint at countless untold stories or hidden passion? Spark right in my flower bed. Here it is just a slight annoyance mixed with acceptance of Hutt's behavior since she already knows what to expect of him. I just wish I knew where some gals get the time during the day. I don't know, by the time I get through scrubbing the kitchen floor, cleaning out the bathtub, hanging up the clothes... They just drop everything, honey. I suppose it does beat housework. This also helps to create Alma not as a mere object of affection or a woman who spends her whole life longing for Hutt, but rather as someone who enjoys his company from time to time, who can find humor in his behavior, who meets him on the same level, is not shocked by his personality and who feels his attraction, but has also experienced enough to not give in to any hidden feelings. I've done my time with one cold-blooded bastard. I'm not looking for another. The chemistry between Patricia Neal and Paul Newman is the most deciding aspect of her work. And both actors did their best to combine a certain level of mutual indifference, respect and clear sexual interest to achieve a wonderful and captivating relationship. There are no illusions within Alma about herself, her position or about Hart that would make her ever act against her own self-protection. Even if Patricia Neal allows Alma certain moments of wandering. I was married to Ed for six years. The only thing he was ever good for was to scratch my back where I couldn't reach it. Still got that itch? Off and on. Well, let me know when it gets to bothering you. 
Even at the end, when the camera doesn't show her at first, when she meets Hutt for the final time, we are not surprised that she remains completely unimpressed by his presence, remaining true to Alma until the end. You ain't letting that little ruckus we had run you off, are you? As far as I can get on a bus ticket. Claiming I'm the first guy that ever stuck his foot in your door? So, considering the small amount of screen time and Patricia Neal's quiet and restrained performance, it is an unusual win for Best Actress. But Patricia Neal's style as Alma also helps to explain the affection for her work and Alma as a character. Because with her performance, she gave Alma a cultural significance beyond the written word. Sure, Hutt was most noteworthy for the way its anti-hero became for many the character to root for, but Patricia Neal also presented a new female point of view in this kind of storyline, where women usually spend most of their time suffering and then paying the ultimate price for their feelings. The Best Actress category mostly saw women turning the other cheek, forgiving their men for their troubles or realizing that they only needed the right kind of love to find happiness. But even so, her entire plotline is essentially her relationship to Hutt, Elma is still the contender in this Oscar lineup, the least defined by a man. Patricia Neal's approach to Elma made her a character that audiences had rarely seen before on the screen, and she made Elma Hutt's equal and rejected traditional role allocations. Elma was not ashamed to enjoy Hutt for his charm and his looks. You want to know something funny? It would have happened eventually without the rough hat. You look pretty good at that, you sure don't, you know. Side of that through the kitchen window made me put down my dish towel more than one. But she always knew exactly how far she would allow herself and him to go. And when Hutt went too far, she left without turning back. Yes, like many other Best Actress winners, Elma evoked sadness. But her confidence and independence also gave us hope. The original script included a passionate goodbye kiss between Hutt and Elma during their final scene, but Patricia Neal would have none of that. Her experience and quietness gave Alma a cultural significance as a woman who maybe only exists in the background, but who clearly knows what she is worth, what she allows herself to enjoy, and what she is willing to accept, and who is always the master of her own fate. I got $200 calf money, if you're short. Hey, you just keep it. And of course, the woman beaten down by life, but always carrying on, finding her own way while keeping her strength and dignity, was a perfect representation of Patricia Neal herself, and it is impossible to overlook the similarities in their personalities, which made Alma such an admired character and Patricia Neal such an admired person. And the Oscar choice ultimately such an easy one. You're a dangerous woman to have around. I'm a good poker player. You're a good housekeeper. You're a good cook. You're a good laundress. What else you good at? Taking care of myself. After Oscar win, Patricia Neal was expecting her fifth child and also ready to take full advantage of a newfound acclaim as an actress. But her life would again be turned upside down when she suffered multiple strokes in 1965 and fell into a coma for three weeks. But as she had done before, she would again come out of this tragedy with her spirit intact. But all of this is a topic for another time. And the next nominee is... 